Just when we thought we haven't suffered enough, Netflix decided to release This Day, the second installment in the 365 Days trilogy based on the book of the same name. So just like before, I will be dissecting the movie and seeing how it compares to the source material. Considering the endings of both the first book and movie were vastly different, there is a major disconnect between the second book and the second movie. In this movie, Laura spends most of the time separated from Massimo, whereas in the book they're barely separated. With major character changes and more characters obsessed with Laura for some fucking reason, we're going to go segment by segment in the movie and at the end I will be discussing major chunks that were cut out from the book. Which is a lot because of the different ways they ended. The events of the movie are more in line with the last quarter of the book. It's one of those things where if you didn't tell me it was based off of a book, I wouldn't have pieced it together that they were connected at all. Before we continue, I would like to issue a trigger warning. This video discusses some sensitive topics, including but not limited to gun violence, physical violence, abusive behavior, and references to Stockholm Syndrome. With that being said, let's get started. The movie starts with Laura and Mossmo getting freaky before their wedding, and her hair is still this dusty ass blonde color. When Olga catches them, Mossmo said, if you want next time you can join us. When you take into account Laura and Olga were kissing in the last movie, it's not out the realm of possibilities. However, I would prefer that encounter not include Massimo, but I never get what I want. This also doesn't make much sense considering she was pregnant at the end of the last movie. All we get from a brief conversation with Olga is that she did end up losing her baby in that tunnel, which then makes me question the timeline. How long was the span of time between movies? Because Massimo still didn't know Laura was pregnant. Wouldn't there be some length of time when they couldn't have sex? Am I expected to believe Massimo waited that long? Especially when he said he would have her whenever and wherever he wanted after she gave her consent once? There really isn't any point in asking questions considering we will be continuing the trend of not getting any answers. This alone was a huge change from the book. In the book, Laura is still very much pregnant. At their actual wedding, we see that her parents are there, which makes no sense considering in the last movie, Laura was told no one from Poland could come to her wedding with the exception of Olga. Continuity? We don't know her. In the book, their wedding was more of like a business meeting for Massimo instead of an actual celebration. Her parents are not there. Her parents don't even find out she's married and pregnant until like halfway through the book. During the reception, Massimo told her that there will be people there that do not speak English. He also said that she needs to figure out how to act in front of people, to which Laura says, We've been married for 20 minutes and you're already bossing me around. Miss Thing, he's been bossing you around since day one. Did you really think marriage was going to change him? The biggest fucking thing I couldn't stand about this book wedding is the fact that Anna was there. You know, Miss The first and real love of Massimo. Massimo says he had no choice but to invite her. Stop the cap. <laughs> I don't buy that for a fucking second. He keeps saying how he'd never let anyone hurt her, yet puts her in the same fucking room as the woman who openly threatened to end her life. What a fucking jackass. As if this guest list couldn't get any more questionable, please enter Adriano Torcelli evil twin brother of Massimo. He's introduced very early on in the book compared to the movie where we don't figure out he's an evil twin until close to the end. I have to introduce him now to make sense of some of the book scenes we will be discussing later and believe it or not, he is somehow fucking worse than Massimo, but I'm getting ahead of myself. During their honeymoon, I think the producers forgot this bitch was supposed to be blonde because she walked up in here with her original hair and Anna Steele's dress from Fifty Shades Darker. I will spare you the awkward golf scene here where Massimo shoots a golf ball into her. Upon returning home, they do find Olga and Domenico smearing cream and fruit all over each other. I cannot show this scene, but I highly recommend just the scenes with Olga and Domenico. They are the only redeeming thing about this movie. This does play out very differently in the book. I am team Netflix with this change because it's a bit triggering. I'm not taking a lot of time to explain it, but it gives me the ick. Adriano drugged Olga and fucked her like a whore. Her words, I've got other words for it, uh, but I can't say those other words, but you all know what I'm thinking. During the attack, Domenico was searching for her and found her. He beat the dog shit out of Adriano and saved Olga, and now Olga and Domenico are a thing. Not as cute and organic as it is in the movie, but so far I enjoy these two in both mediums way more than I enjoy Laura and Massimo. Back to the movie, Massimo arranges for an outing for Laura and Olga, causing Laura to snap at him for no reason. I arranged a little trip for you two. Do I look like furniture that you can move around? I just want you to have fun with your friend. Oh really? It's not a joke. Why well, don't you put a leash on me? I mean, out of all the things he's done, this is the hill you're willing to die on? 
Ugh, my head hurts. At this outing, Laura complains that Mossimo isn't giving her enough attention. At this point, I don't know what to say. What can one say about this? She's mad when he tries to control her, but also mad when he's not around enough to control her. Olga, my sweet Olga, gives her creative idea to seduce Mossimo, which, sure, I guess it works, but it kind of backfires when the morning after Mossimo leaves for work instead of staying in bed with her. After this, she meets back up with Olga for another round of complaining that is interrupted by Mossimo, who tells him it's time to go. This leads to another argument between the two where Laura calls him controlling. Flashback. Fuck off. If that's your idea how falling in love with you looks like, you fucking wrong. I have no idea why she thinks that. While Laura takes time to cool off away from Mossimo, she meets Nacho. Nacho is a Spanish gardener who just started working for Massimo. They chat, and he seems overall very nice, and Laura offers him water, and he leaves. This happens in the book as well, but at a very different point. This doesn't happen until over at the halfway point, yet we're barely into this movie. It's all kinds of fucked up. It's a Merry Mafia Christmas here at the Torcelli household. Laura and Massimo exchange gifts. More specifically, Massimo gives Laura a present, and Laura gives him, well, You'll see. Massimo got her a clothing line because of her love of design. You know, the love of design that was never discussed in either previous book or movie. How are we supposed to believe she likes fashion design? The closest thing we get to her love of fashion is one of the 5 million shopping montages in the first movie. I don't have any more energy to focus on them right now. Let's get back to the it couple of the movie. Domenico proposes to Olga. Pumpkin. Voice I wish it went this well in the book. Again, Netflix was right for changing this. Laura and Massimo were still fighting, and to surprise her for the holiday, he flew in her parents and Olga. I mention Olga because by Christmas in the book, Olga had had enough of Domenico and left back for Poland. Book Domenico is very hot and cold for me. He was so kind and sweet in the first book, but in the second book, you start to see more of how he and Massimo are in fact brothers. This will be discussed more at the end when I talk about the big chunks of the book that were cut from the movie. Now on to Massimo's gift from Laura. Nothing says Merry Christmas like recreating the first time your husband you. I'm not joking. That's literally what's happening. In the first movie, there was a scene where Massimo chained Laura to a bed without her consent and made her watch him get head from some random woman and then made weird threats before letting her go. Laura is dressed exactly like that woman paired with handcuffs. I can't show you the scenes, but for comparison, this is the girl from the first movie and this is Laura in the second. There are not enough words in the English, Polish, or Italian language to explain how fucked up that is. After they, you know, Laura thanked him for bringing her family to Sicily and asked him about his family, which is usually shit you talk about before marriage, but I digress. Because besides Domenico, you have nobody. This is the first mention in the movies of Domenico being Massimo's family. They do not specify how he is family, but in the first book, we do know that they are half-brothers. In the second book, we learn that they are half-brothers and cousins. That's right, Massimo and Domenico's mothers were sisters. We know Massimo's parents died in a boating accident, and we know nothing about Domenico's mother. Movie Massimo says that he has a brother. Laura flips out pissed off that he never told her that, and Massimo refuses to elaborate. I have already introduced him in this video, but he is talking about Adriano. Movie Laura does not know that he has a twin brother. That factoid is important in the gala they attend after Christmas. Before that, Olga and Laura go to this building. I assume it has something to do with her clothing line. Not important. The important bit is that Laura is still pissed at Massimo for not giving her the attention, so much so that Olga asked her again what was wrong, to which Laura says, <laughs> Comical considering she told Olga everything from Massimo's visions to her eventual kidnapping in the first movie, but sure. Him not giving you enough attention is totally a reason for you to be snarky to your best friend for simply asking if you were okay. That's all I needed to say about that. We're skipping now to the gala itself. Laura interrupts Massimo speaking to another mafia person because she's needy, which Massimo doesn't like. He tells her to stay put while he goes to do mafia shit. Laura then has a conversation with her parents who may or may not know what he actually does. The movie never establishes it. Anyway, she speaks to them saying she wished Massimo looked at her the way her dad looked at her mom. If that's something you wanted, you probably shouldn't have married the mob boss who kidnapped you. This is not helped by her seeing who she thinks is Massimo with Anna on a balcony before they disappear together. 
She follows them until she found them fucking with Anna looking smugly at her. Upon first viewing, I didn't even notice it, but if you look closely at his hands, you will see that the tattoos are not there. And that's because this isn't Massimo, it's Adriano pretending to be Massimo to try and drive a wedge between Laura and Massimo. It works. Laura leaves the event running into Nacho who asked if she was okay, in which turn she asked him to take her away from there and he did as she asked and drove her to his home. While looking for Laura, her mother approaches Massimo, pissed because she left a voicemail saying that she was leaving Massimo and now Laura's missing. She slapped Massimo and says they're going to go wait in Poland for her. Just a, just a couple of things. One, if my daughter was missing in a foreign country, I'm not going to go home and wait. I'm planting my ass in that country until I find my kid. Two, if I felt I knew who may be involved in said kid's disappearance, I'm slapping them a lot harder than... When I tell you if that was me, my Pim Pam would have been stronger than Goku when he slapped the dog shit out of Frieza. <laughs> now this is wild in the book. By the time the gala happens, Laura is made fully aware of the existence and has met Adriano. Okay, she knows he has an evil twin. So when Laura tried to surprise Mosmo with, you guessed it, more sex, he found Adriano fucking Anna thinking it was Mosmo. Without waiting for confirmation, Laura bolts. But this is not where she meets Nacho. Nacho's not even a factor until way after Laura and Massimo are temporarily separated. In the book, when she thinks Massimo cheated, she gathered Olga and she ran back to Poland where she had a doctor friend remove the tracking device Massimo had implanted in the first book. Then they ran to Hungary to hide out with an old fling of Olga's. Honestly, the Nacho stuff is kind of boring. However, I take boring and kind of cheesy over whatever the fuck Massimo's been doing any day. Nacho is like the polar opposite of Massimo. Nacho has a personality, a sense of humor, he can cook, he has tattoos, he treats Laura well, never touching her inappropriately. He introduces her to his sister. It's not known exactly how much his sister Amelia does know, but she is also kind and welcoming to Laura. Everything seems very sweet here. She's pregnant, which kind of stuns Laura, considering she did recently lose her own baby. This is a stark contrast to the book where Nacho drugged and kidnapped her. He kept her in his home because she's pregnant and he didn't want to harm the baby. When his sister comes for a visit, he threatens Laura into complying with a lie that she is his Polish girlfriend as Amelia does not know what her brother does as a mafia hitman. The Nachos are very different, but the Amelias are pretty much the same. I do also want to mention the tidbit in the book where Laura says, they both look adorable together, nothing like traditional Spaniards. So in the first book, we were going on and on about typical Italians. Now we've got traditional Spaniards. I wonder what culture of people we're going to be weird about in the next book. Nacho continues to charm Laura, so much so that she has a wet dream about him, considering the fact she's still under the impression Massimo cheated on her and the circumstances of their relationship as a whole. It makes a bit of sense that she's getting very attached very quickly to the first guy who showed her any amount of kindness. I mean, he's teaching her how to surf, he's taking her on picnics and watching movies with her. It's easy to see why she's feeling that fantasy. I'm feeling that fantasy. During this time with Nacho, Massimo is still looking for Laura. He meets up with Anna to gauge to see if she has Laura. Anna is overly flirty, saying that only a Sicilian woman can handle Sicilian man or some dumb shit like that. Once he deduces that she does not have his wife, he gets the fuck out of there. Back to Nacho and Laura. Things are getting heated when one night someone broke into Nacho home to try to get to Laura. Nacho tackles the assailant. Laura runs, but the way this house is built for some reason, Laura basically ran in a circle just to reappear right as Nacho killed the man. Now we are starting to see that there's more to Nacho than just being a gardener. This happens in the book and it's explained that the man who broke into her home was someone who worked for Massimo and tasked with killing Laura. Though they don't think Massimo actually wanted Laura dead, it may just be a rogue employee who was paid to try and kill her. In the movie, I've deduced that Massimo did send the man because we did get this tidbit of Massimo and Domenico in the car where Domenico says he survived, to which Massimo throws a toddler-esque tantrum. È sopravvissuto. With Nacho and Laura, he took her out to make her feel better after the attack the night before. After they spend time together, he says that they are going to go meet his dad, but his sister will also be there. Laura does not directly meet his father. She has lunch with Amelia where she can see Nacho and his father having a very tense conversation. Laura is clearly getting a bit suspicious about who he really is, but that doesn't stop her from daydreaming about him dicking her down. Again, 
This does not happen in the book. Considering Laura knew who and what he was from Jump, she knew how dangerous he was, yet that didn't stop her from on God contemplating cheating on Massimo with him. She blames this on the fact that she is pregnant with a raging libido and would fuck anyone at that moment. Mind you, Laura knows Massimo did not cheat on her. She knows her husband gets homicidal when it comes to her, yet still wants to sleep with him, and when Nacho kissed her, she admits to not fighting back. What the actual fuck? Laura's suspicions are validated when Nacho tells her that they're going to an event. Her confusion morphs into anger when Nacho tells her that Massimo will be there. This implies that Nacho may be involved in the mafia. And there is no maybe when he admits, I am Marcelo Nacho Matos, son of Don Fernando Matos, the head of the local mafia and the eternal arrival of your husband's family. Nacho was tasked with bringing Lore onto their territory. It never got to that point because she left with him willingly, which I mentioned is different from the book where Nacho drugged and kidnapped her. Lore is obviously pissed that he's just another mafia man who wants to try to toy with her, but Nacho says that everything he did for her and his feelings were 100% real. You think I would fake all of this? Take you to the beach, teach you to surf, and the kiss? Though I believe him, I do believe Lore does not deserve him. When I say I want to be with a mafia man, I mean mafia men like Nacho, respectful, caring to their women, but also a cold-hearted killer. I might have some issues, but this video is not about me. It's about Laura and her Stockholm Syndrome doing Stockholm Syndrome things. I mean, she spent a week away from Massimo and she seems more lively and smiled way more than she ever did with Massimo. Yes, Nacho's a bad guy, but he's not a bad guy. But even though Nacho treated her right, she still is desperate to get back to Massimo. Now this is the final act of the movie and just like before they deviate from the book pretty severely. In the movie, Nacho brings Laura to his father's home and she's escorted away by guards. We cut to Fernando discussing with Massimo why he did what he did. Massimo apparently got too greedy and encroached on their territory. They issued a warning in the form of Laura's accident, which I always assumed was Anna who openly threatened Laura, but sure, it was Fernando. He says that he wanted Massimo to step down as head of the Torcellis and let Adriano rule in his stead, which makes no sense because he then says, We figured your stupid brother will do perfect. He's so blinded with revenge and greed that he doesn't care much for the family business. I'm confused on what they are wanting here. Massimo refuses and demands his wife. Fernando says that his personal bodyguard is with her, but then Nacho steps in and says that that's not true. She left with some other guards. Fernando tells him in Spanish to go find her. Nacho and Massimo leave together to go find Laura, who for some reason is standing in the middle of this open ass area. She's looking around like she just materialized there instead of being walked in. She sees Adriano thinking that he's Massimo and starts hitting him for cheating on her, but then she noticed what we did. No tattoos. He's even cringier than Massimo. I mean... But it's nice to meet you, baby girl. <laughs> I need a shower after hearing that. Adriano is trying to be the Joker so bad. From his mannerisms to the way he talks, it's giving Dollar Tree Joker. Laura is confused, but when she steps back, she is confronted by Anna with a gun. Massimo and Nacho show up. Adriano has a gun on Laura. Sometimes I wonder if your child would have looked more like you. Like her. Massimo still had no idea about the baby, so this was a bit crushing for him. Laura manages to get away from Adriano and runs to Massimo, but is shot by Anna. Nacho then shoots Anna, and then Massimo shoots his brother. Like, in the shoulder though. Like, I guarantee you Mans is not dead. I don't care if you're my mother. If you try to kill my wife, I'm fucking you up. Massimo comforts Laura, who's bleeding on the floor. Nacho accepts defeat and leaves them. She obviously isn't dead, there's still another movie on the way. Now this is vastly different from the book. Nacho takes Laura directly to Fernando, who says Massimo decided not to join them and he requests Nacho leave and he obeys. When Nacho leaves, another man comes in that Laura doesn't know, but it's obvious that he knows Laura. He starts to attack her, calling her names because of what Massimo did to him because of her. This is the guy from the club in the first book that tried to assault Laura, resulting in Massimo shooting his hands. His name is Flavio. And if that twist wasn't twisty enough, it's also revealed that he is the son-in-law of Fernando, AKA 
Amelia's husband. Amelia doesn't know this. Like Nacho, Fernando, and her husband all go to great lengths to hide their true careers from her. While this man is hitting her, Mosmo bursts in and this is where the gunfight ensues. Nacho returns and upon seeing Laura, he felt remorse for not knowing what was going to happen. Laura ended up getting shot by Flavio, resulting in Nacho shooting Flavio. From here, the book that's always been in Laura's perspective shifts to Massimo. He took Laura to a hospital where Domenico tells him he can't save them both. He has to choose between Laura and the baby, which makes no sense because she's only like four months pregnant. I feel like this was added just for a more dramatic cliffhanger while we wait for book three, as the book literally ends with, I lifted my eyes and took a deep breath. Save. I shit you not when I tell you about 75% of this book was cut because it did not fit the narrative that they spun for the first movie. For the most part, I agree with it because the segments that got cut have no bearing on the overall plot. Much like the first book, we have all these characters who feel like they may come back later but so far have nothing to do with anything. For example, Marco in the first book, he makes it clear that Massimo can't kill him for reasons and seems fond of Laura. It makes sense that maybe he comes back later to stir up trouble, but there's not a single mention of him in the second book. So let me explain what I mean for this book. The first big cut was when Laura decided to leave Massimo when she thought he cheated on her. I mentioned previously how Laura and Olga go to Poland long enough to get money and have the tracker removed before they went to Hungary to stay with Olga's ex, Istvan, who is a bit older, and his son, Attila. And I do apologize if I butchered those names. Attila says that he is gay and during the two month time that Laura and Olga stay there with them, Laura begins to think of him as the little brother. Their 10 year age gap also did help her see him as a little brother too. The problem then strikes when the girls decide to go back to Poland and Attila loses his shit. He pins Laura against the wall and kisses her saying he lied about being gay and wanted her since the moment he met her. The girls leave hungry and this is never brought up again. The next major event comes when Massimo agrees to take Laura and Olga to Poland to see a championship MMA fight as apparently Laura has some kind of interest in it. She has an interest in MMA because of her ex Damien who is a fighter. See where this is going? Yeah, so they get to the fight and of course her ex is fighting. What pisses me off is she describes their relationship as basically perfect and the only reason they broke up was because he had to move to Spain for work. Of course Massimo didn't like this and even promised not to hurt Damien after he found out that he used to be with Laura. He still arranged for Damien to end up in a car accident. And after this, Laura felt lonely as hell because at this point, Olga had left for Poland for good. Her marriage was toxic and makes her feel isolated. So Laura decides to call Damien. They have a pleasant conversation and she promised to call him every now and then because he isn't allowed to call her or else Massimo would come for him. Damien hints at still wanting her even though she's pregnant, asking her if she ever wanted her old life back and Laura's answer is concerning to say the least. It's not that simple. I'm the wife of a very powerful powerful man, he wouldn't let me go, but I carry his child too, and nobody normal would have me. I have too much going on." She didn't say no. <laughs> she basically is saying Massimo wouldn't let her leave, which is concerning. After this conversation, he is never mentioned or brought up again. My third and final point, Domenico. He had a total personality flip. He went from this sweet, kind guy from the first book to some coke-fueled monster in this one. Granted, he is still a lot better than Massimo, I just didn't like how different he was here. He was the reason Olga left Sicily to move back to Poland. After they get the whole cheating scandal sorted out, they do go back to Poland to visit. Olga and Laura run into one of Olga's exes who try to make a move on her and Domenico takes matters into his own hands and fights the dude, which causes him to be arrested. Since this is not their country, it's a bit of a tough situation. While Massimo tries to get Domenico out of jail, Olga decides to try and help. Her ex agreed to drop the charges if she had sex with him, but she had to speak English to him the entire time and actually climax. So she did. Domenico was released and Massimo respects her for going that far for his brother, but her ex, Adam, happened to have also recorded the encounter with the intention of showing it to Domenico in prison. But he is out of prison and back in Sicily with Olga when he sees it. He's snapped at Olga, throwing bottles at her, getting real aggressive. Yes, on the surface it looks bad, but once the situation is explained to him, he's remorseful and even asks Olga to marry him. Overwhelmed, she decides to leave and go back to Poland only to return to spend the holiday with Laura. I'm in heavy agreement with the changes that Netflix made for the movie. The book did not make a lot of sense. We had three other guys who were obsessed with Laura in the first book, Martin, Piotr, and Marco, yet we only saw Martin in the film. Now in this book, we've also added Attila, Damien, and Nacho to the equation, 
when again, two out of those three don't really matter. This book is over 400 pages for absolutely no reason. If you took out the bit with Damien and Attila, this book could have easily been 100 pages shorter. But don't get it twisted, I don't think these movies are good by any stretch of the imagination. I made these videos one, because I love comparing books to their movie adaptations. Two, I dislike the genuine idolization of men like Massimo. If you're going to fuck a mafia man, fuck one like Nacho. Not book Nacho. Exclusively movie Nacho. Big, tattoos, respectful to women who can and will kill people. Mafia romances usually aren't my thing, but I have read quite a few in my life. And personally, I gravitate more towards the mafia men that are kind and loving to their women. I am into domination in the bedroom, that's fine, but the second you try to tell me what to do when Dick's not involved, I get volatile. And that's all I'm saying on that. Again, this video is not about my issues. So, please remember to drink water and return your library books on time, or else. Yo, Wrench. Yo, Em. Damn, man, I hope you kept the receipts. Hey, yo, check out this fuck stick. So tell us about Home 2.0. <laughs> Home systems are completely bulletproof. Your privacy is absolutely secure. Bold claim, Steven. Aren't you worried hacker groups will see that as a challenge? Well, say what you mean, Shirley. Dead sec. Now, if they want to go up against us, I invite them to try. <laughs> Home 2.0 is an OS with teeth. Yo, he called us out by name? Yep. He don't know who he fucking with. It's on now. Yeah, that's why I've been trying to crack 2.0. There's just one see little problem. What? Here, hold this. Stand back. Great. Chip. It's a little oh, hard to get out. Look, there's no point in trying to use the previous version's hardware to jack the new OS. Why? Because they changed the ports. Following the capital's guide to forced obsolescence. Uh, but luckily, a little birdie told me that 2.0 should be packing a farm fresh zero day. Ooh, now that might just be a shame. Damn right. And that is why you, my friend, are going to hijack me a 2.0 pre-order shipment before some do-gooder white hat Tells home how to cock block us. You've got a weird relationship with technology. You know that, right? Kidding me. 